Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. The other day, Sean McDowell, the son of Josh McDowell, hosted Alan Parr to discuss Alan's new book on discernment, Seven Lies That Distort the Gospel. And best I could tell, six of those seven pertain to charismatics. Shocking, I know. And even more shocking is that none of the lies he mentioned have anything to do with cessationism or Calvinism or Lordship Salvation. Now, before I go any further, let me just say that I appreciate the apologetics work done by Josh McDowell, and here's my copy of his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Unfortunately, Sean seems to have joined the Cool Kids Club. Evangelical YouTubers like Mike Winger, Bobby Conway, Alan Parr, Melissa Doherty, Elisa Childers, Ali Beth Stuckey, Frank Turek, Remnant Radio, and Stephen Bancars. These guys love to go for the low-hanging fruit of charismatics and charismatic theology on a regular basis for clicks, views, and subs. So in this first clip, Alan provides a glimpse into his background. Uh, coming out of a very, very traditional Baptist church that I grew up in, um, uh, I, didn't go to, I did not go to church my whole freshman year. Uh, my sophomore year, I ended up um, attending a charismatic church. And, um, you know, I'm not against any charismatic churches. I think uh, there are many wonderful charismatic churches. And uh, I thank God for my experience at this church. But this specific church, which happened to be charismatic, mm. uh, there were some things that were happening in the church service um, that I did not understand. And I had no concept for whether it was biblically accurate or theologically sound or anything because I'm a new Christian. And uh, I could go into all sorts of details about them sure. trying to push me down and and forcing me to speak in tongues and teaching me that, you know, I needed to have this experience and things like that we might touch on. But the thing is, is that um, because I did not have a context for how to interpret whether this was accurate or not, um, once I was able to get removed from that experience about three or four years later, um, after studying the Word of God, it just created in me a hunger and thirst to sure. want to help other people who might also be caught up in that situation right now and help them to be able to have the tools to be able to discern truth from error. So Alan grew up in a traditional Baptist church, just like me. Then he started going to a charismatic church where they displayed some extremist behavior, as frequently happens in the charismatic world. I went through the same thing in the Pentecostal church back in the 70s. I've been pressured to speak in tongues. I've been prayed for and yelled at and shaken around. You name it. And you know what? I was never offended by any of that. I knew that those people wanted what was best for me, even if they didn't always use wisdom in how they went about it. I just filtered all of that silliness out because I was learning a lot about the Bible. So unlike Alan, I didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Interesting how two people can have similar backgrounds and come away with a completely different perspective. Anyway, at the end of that clip, he pretty much admits that warning people about charismatics is a high priority for him. Well, that's fine, because warning people about Bible teachers who push unbelief and Calvinism is a high priority for me. In the next clip, Sean admits that this is personal with him, too. So I think a lot of people maybe who haven't written a book don't realize there's always such a backstory and a personal experience and a motivation behind talking about some of these lies. And in your case, it's academic in one sense, but it's very personal. You've seen this amongst your followers and subscribers and your family. So when we get into this for folks watching, realizing this isn't just you know some academic issue, this is personal and lives are at stake. And I appreciate that sense of urgency in your book. The problem with making theology personal is that if you're not careful, you can abandon any objectivity and slip into wrong assumptions and end up misrepresenting the facts. I see that all the time with the discernment crowd. Their passion to defend the truth and protect God's people from false doctrine pushes them to the other extreme, where they present secondary issues as essential issues so that they can justify condemning people that they actually agree with on true essentials. I'm not saying that Sean is doing that, but he sure seems to be going that direction in this video. 
In the next clip, Alan discusses progressive Christianity. Well, you know, it's interesting, Sean, whenever I started writing this book, um, the one that I'm going to share in just a moment wasn't one that was probably on my radar as the top, oh, uh, interesting. the biggest threat. Um, okay. But, um, you know, it's probably chapter five where I talk about uh, progressive Christianity. And mm. I know that's something that you and I have talked a little bit offline about, but I think the, the reason why to me that's so damaging is because it's so subtle because um, it promises people that you can pretty much kind of have the best of both worlds. You can have Christ, mm. but on your own terms, right? You can remain in whatever lifestyle you would like to remain in. You can accept the parts of Christ that you want to accept, um, you know, diminishes the finished work of Christ and things of that nature, which we might talk a little bit about later. But to me, that's a huge threat to the gospel because it can deceive people into thinking hey, I can be a Christian, but I can also deny some of the core tenets mm. of the Christian faith, excuse me, that Christians have held near and dear for, uh, you know, two millennia. The problem here is that Alan seems to be lumping all progressive Christians together. Now, in case you don't know, progressives run the gamut from believers who affirm all of the essentials of the faith, but struggle with things like slavery and genocide in the Bible, to those who reject penal substitutionary atonement, to people who teach liberation theology, to people who seem to promote pantheism or universalism. Lumping all of them together, as some in the cool kids club seem to do, is just intellectually lazy. In this clip, Sean talks about his experience of working in a Pentecostal church. I actually worked at a Pentecostal church in LA for a year. And it was an incredible, right in the heart of LA. For, for me, growing up in a small town in the mountains of San Diego, it rocked my world on so many levels. And there were different charismatic gifts that were just not familiar to me in my background. And there were a few people, not most, who I got questions of like, wait a minute, does Sean speak in tongues? Is he really saved? These kinds of questions would come up. Now, the church as a whole didn't preach that. But these kind of questions, I experienced them personally in that setting. Now, in my 49 years in the Pentecostal, neo-Pentecostal, charismatic world, I've never met one person who would say that you're not saved if you don't speak in tongues. I know that people like that exist, especially in the oneness Pentecostal world. But in the vast majority of Pentecostal and charismatic churches, they know better. I suspect that what happened was that somebody learned that Sean doesn't speak in tongues and they told him that he needs to get the Holy Ghost. And he interpreted that as them saying that he's not saved. You have to understand that most of the time when a Pentecostal says something like that, they're not saying that you're not saved. They're just saying that you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a subsequent experience to salvation. It's like when we talk about the sun coming up or going down. We don't mean that the sun revolves around the earth. We know how the solar system works. It's just a habit that we've adopted in saying it that way. And Pentecostal people have a habit of saying, you need the Holy Ghost, instead of saying, you need to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues as a subsequent experience to salvation so that you'll be empowered for service. In the next clip, Sean seems to confirm that they didn't actually tell him that he's not saved, but he took it that way. Must someone speak in tongues to be saved? I've had people tell me this basically to my face. Have you spoken in tongues? And clearly implying that if I hadn't in the way they understand it, I'm not saved. Notice he said implying and in the way that they understand it. Now, I could be wrong, after all, there are extremists in every theological persuasion, but my guess is that if you pressed Sean on this, he would have to admit that they didn't actually tell him, you're not saved because you don't speak in tongues. In this clip, Alan tells us what speaking in tongues is. So this first distortion we're talking about is related to speaking in tongues. So maybe before we get into some of the distortions about this, just explain to us what is the gift of tongues and do you think it's still operative today? Yeah, so, you know, um, the exact nature of the gift of tongues is, is debated. Um, and mm. I, see, um, I see arguments on both sides of this. So, you know, on one side, 
Um, you know, some people will say that the gift of tongues um, has ceased, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, because the original gift of tongues was the ability for someone to be able to speak um, in a language that maybe they've never learned, or um, depending upon how you interpret Acts chapter 2, maybe they weren't speaking in that language, but they were speaking something that they didn't even understand with their human mind, but the hearers on the mm. other side were hearing the, the word of God being communicated to them in a language that they understood. So it's kind of a little bit unclear as to whether I'm speaking Japanese, having never learned Japanese, and you're Japanese and you're hearing it, or I'm just speaking something, and I don't know what I'm saying, but you're hearing it as Japanese. Regardless Got of what it. it is, the purpose was to communicate the truth of the word of God and get it to more people with me not having previous knowledge of that person's language. This is a common misconception that I've addressed several times. Nobody in the Bible preached the gospel via the gift of tongues. The Roman Empire had a universal language, Koine Greek, and they didn't need the gift of tongues to communicate. Tongues were manifested as a sign to unbelievers to arrest their attention so that they would listen to the gospel when it was preached in a language they already knew. In the next clip, Alan explains why it's wrong to say that all believers should speak in tongues. Should every Christian speak in tongues? After all, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul kind of says, I wish all of you would speak in tongues. So shouldn't we all aim to do this in our personal lives? Yeah, once again, um, you know, that's another a misunderstanding of Scripture because um, in 1 Corinthians, in the exact same book, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe it's in verse 7, where Paul says, hey, I wish that all of you were single like me, but each one has his own gift, right? So when Paul is saying, I wish that every single person was single, he's saying, hey, I wish that everybody had the freedom to be able to be unencumbered un un you know, with hmm. the responsibilities of married life and family life to be able to just evangelize and, and serve the Lord. But Paul also acknowledges that that is not, just because he wishes that, doesn't mean that's always going to happen. In the same way, you could say, hey, I wish that every Christian would be able to speak in tongues hmm. so that no matter where you go in this world, you'll be able to communicate God's truth even though you don't know their language. Yeah, Paul would wish that. But to say that that wish is also a reality and a, even a possibility would once again contradict what he said in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says, "Are not do all people speak in tongues? Mm. Do, are all people apostles? Are all people teachers? And the obvious expected answer to all those questions is no. The problem with comparing what Paul said about remaining single with speaking in tongues should be obvious when you read the passage he's referring to. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Paul was not saying this as a commandment. This was just his opinion. But starting in verse 10, he says that he's speaking by the Spirit of God. Then in verse 12, he's making it clear that again, this is his opinion. But receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit is something that the disciples were told to do in Luke 24 and Acts 1. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Luke 24, 49. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 1, 8. On the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues. 
When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then in Acts 8, verses 14 through 20, we read, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. In Acts 9, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized. And when Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Then in Acts 10, the Bible says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then in Acts 19 it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. On three of these occasions, we're told that they spoke in tongues. It doesn't say that Saul, also known as Paul, spoke in tongues, but we know that he did because he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. And it doesn't say that they spoke in tongues in Samaria, but Simon the sorcerer saw something that convinced him that something supernatural had occurred, which is why he offered money to be able to impart the Holy Spirit as Peter and the others did. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit accompanied by speaking in tongues seems to have been normative in the early church and occurred as a result of the Lord's instructions. That's quite a contrast to Paul stating his opinion on remaining single. Again, receiving the Holy Spirit as an endowment with power was a command. Remaining single wasn't. In this clip, Alan defines prosperity gospel. Can you define for us what you mean by the prosperity gospel? And I'm curious, Alan, how big of a deal you think it is in the U.S. and beyond? Well, uh, good question. So, um, you know, the prosperity gospel in its simplest, um, in, in the simplest form is the idea that embedded in the gospel or as a part of the finished work of Jesus Christ, uh, what he accomplished on the cross by dying on the cross for our sins, embedded in that work is a promise from God that um, our lives are going to be characterized by health and wealth. And so okay. because of what Christ has done, we have the ability to tap into this this vault of blessings that include (laughs) health and wealth, which is dangerous because then it depends on my faith to be able to unlock that vault, which we'll Mm -hmm. get into in just a moment. Um, And so the idea is that it's available to you if you have enough faith. And and so that's a very dangerous um, doctrine because you're now 
in a sense, adding to what Jesus did on the cross. The focus was to die on the cross for our sins and to experience a spiritual reconnection with God. His focus was not to promise us some life that's free from pain, suffering, sickness, and and uh, you know poverty. Kudos to these two for defining the term here. Most critics just condemn it without attempting to define it. Now, let me just add this disclaimer here before I go any further. I've never heard anybody in the Word of Faith movement make any reference to the prosperity gospel. That's an expression used by the critics. The gospel preached is essentially the same as the gospel preached in the Baptist church and Pentecostal churches. I know, because I grew up Baptist, and I spent six years in a Pentecostal church. But the theology regarding healing and prosperity is clearly different. Word of Faith critics tend to conflate our theology in this area with our presentation of the gospel, and that's where the confusion comes in. That would be like me accusing Presbyterians of preaching an infant baptism gospel or primitive Baptists of preaching a foot-washing gospel. People can have distinctive views on secondary issues without preaching a false gospel. So Allen says that in the prosperity gospel, health and wealth are promised as a result of the atonement. Well, not exactly. We're not promised or guaranteed any blessing from God. They're provided for us, but as James said, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. You shouldn't expect to receive anything from God if you don't ask in faith. Healing and prosperity aren't promised, they're provided for as a part of our covenant with God, but they're received by faith. In the Old Covenant, God told Israel that if they kept the law, he would take sickness away from their midst and they would be blessed financially. And Hebrews 8.6 tells us that we have a better covenant than Israel's. This is not adding to what Jesus did on the cross. This is recognizing the fact that far more was provided than we have been led to believe by religious tradition. Sickness and poverty are a result of the fall of man and of the curse that ensued. As part of the work of redemption, the curse was reversed to a certain extent. We still grow old and die, but we don't have to die from sickness, just as Israel was told that they could live out their days free from sickness. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Exodus 23, 25, and 26. We don't have to live in poverty, just as Israel was told that they would be blessed in the basket and blessed in the store. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Deuteronomy 28, 5 through 8. I could offer you more proof texts, but I'm giving you all of these scriptures for a reason. Alan has a tendency to talk in cliches and address these issues in a superficial manner. But as you can see, there's plenty of scripture to support the belief that healing and prosperity in our covenant relationship with God through what Jesus did are more than just figments of the imagination. Hopefully he goes into this more deeply in his book. I don't plan on reading it because I've been hearing Alan's rap for a few years now, and I think I've pretty much got a handle on his views. In this clip, Alan says prosperity doesn't work in poor countries. If it indeed is the gospel, then it needs to work in every part of the world. And so when you have people on other, in other parts of the world that are sometimes living on two or three dollars a day uh, for their whole family, you know, you'd have to ask the question, you know, would that be considered prosperity? If you ask any you know, prosperity teacher, would you be okay with living uh, for, you know, with two or three dollars a day? They probably would not say that that 
really, you know, in, is a, is characteristic of mm. prosperity. So um, if it doesn't work for the entire world, then it can't be part of the gospel. Well, I can show you people in second and third world countries who are experiencing upward mobility after hearing biblical teaching on faith. When Africa began opening up to the gospel about 30 years ago, most of the people lived in relatively primitive conditions. Today, many of them have moved into houses with electricity and indoor plumbing, and they're driving cars instead of riding around on a bike. Their standard of living may not be what ours is, but we've had the benefit of centuries of Christianity in our country, where they've only had a few decades. In his book, The Midas Touch, A Balanced Approach to Biblical Prosperity, Kenneth Hagin said, Prosperity is relative. For some people, being able to pay their bills and provide the basic comforts of life for their families would be a great blessing, a definite step up. In some countries, being prosperous might mean having a bicycle or motorcycle to ride, or an ox to plow the fields to plant a crop. So the fact that people in other countries don't experience the same prosperity that we do doesn't mean that God doesn't desire to prosper them or enable them to prosper, but it takes time to move from one economic level to another. But missionaries who teach prosperity are seeing their people over the years move out of their mud huts and into houses and out of primitive church structures to modern facilities. But you're not going to see that sitting in your YouTube studio in America. You've got to be in touch with people who are actually living abroad and doing the work of winning the lost and making disciples, which includes teaching people how to believe God for healing and provision. In this clip, Sean talks about suffering. Uh, Alan, you know, I did my PhD dissertation on the death of the apostles. And one of the things that I did is I went through the entire New Testament, and I noted every time one of the followers of Jesus or Jesus himself suffered, or the biblical writers taught that you would suffer as a result of your faith, and it blew me away how much I missed this. I'd invite all my viewers to read the New Testament and just pay attention. It's all over the Gospels. It's all over the letters of Paul. By the way, he wrote many of those letters while he was suffering in prison, such as the letter to the Philippians. It's all over Hebrews. We read about this, especially in the Hall of Faith. It's in the book of James. And of course, it's in Revelation. Now, first of all, many scholars believe that Paul wrote Philippians while he was under house arrest in Rome that we read about in Acts 28. In which case, he wasn't writing from a smelly dungeon, but from an apartment. It's interesting that you never hear prosperity critics mention that Paul was allowed to await his hearing under house arrest rather than while rotting in prison because he could afford his own place. A less prosperous man couldn't have done that. Real estate in Rome wasn't cheap, but Paul could afford his own place and was allowed to receive visitors for the two years he was under house arrest. And as for the suffering point, Sean is conflating suffering from persecution with suffering from sickness. None of the apostles died from heart disease or diabetes or pneumonia or cancer. They were martyred. And the only one who wasn't martyred, John, died in his 90s, according to church tradition. Word of Faith theology doesn't say that we won't be persecuted or experience difficulties in life. That's a strong man representation of what we believe. Jesus promised us tribulation, but then added that he had overcome the world. You can live in health and prosperity and still experience persecution. In fact, one of the reasons the Jews were persecuted in Nazi Germany is because they were prosperous. There's plenty of room for suffering in life apart from sickness and poverty. Sometimes you're alienated from family members when you decide to follow the Lord. Sometimes people will hurl insults at you, call you names, damage your property, or maybe they'll even attack you physically. In some nations, you might be killed for your faith. I don't know of anybody who would deny the reality of any of that. But let's face it, most Christians who are sick or broke aren't that way because of their Christian faith. And it has zero to do with persecution. In this clip, Alan says that Word of Faith teaching makes God our servant, when according to the Bible, we're supposed to serve Him. 
Yeah, well, you know, um, you know, I think one of the biggest concerns is that um, it it essentially makes God subservient to us, and it reverses mm. the roles, right? So what's supposed to be happening is that God speaks, we listen and act. But with the word of faith theology, it's kind of the other way around. It's, you know what, God, I'm going to speak something that I want to happen in my life, and because my words have power and you've given me the authority to speak this over my life, now you in heaven must uh, you must react to that, and you have to now bring to fruition what I have spoken into reality, and so you exist to bring my desires to, to life mm. rather than, wait, no, I exist to bring your desires to life, and it's a reversal of roles, and mm. that can be very dangerous. This is nonsense. According to Romans 10, 9, and 10, confessing Jesus as Lord is how we get saved. Are we forcing God to give us eternal life when we do that? Of course not. What we're actually doing is receiving by faith what God has provided for us. It's God's will for us to be saved. And we bring that about by believing and confessing. This is called synergism. God and man working together to bring about his will for his glory. The Calvinist believes in monergism. God makes it all happen so he can get all the glory. So unless you're a Calvinist, all Christians believe to a certain extent that our faith and confession play a role in receiving what God wants to bless us with. So the issue isn't so much the role of confession as it is determining what God's will is so that we can see that come about. And in this last clip, Alan says that our words indeed do have power, but not as the Word of Faith teaches. You can criticize, you can blame, you can destroy someone's reputation, you can malign, you can slander, you can gossip, uh, you can discourage. Hmm. I mean, you can do a lot of negative things with your, with, your, with your mouth, with our words, right? And they all have significant power. Telling a, a kid in, in elementary school that they're never going to be good at anything and that, you know, um, they're too slow and they're never going to be a good reader and they're never going to be athletic. I mean, just try saying a couple of these things to your own kids and see what type of impact it's going to have. So our words have significant power. Well, let's look at Mark 11, where Jesus cursed the fig tree. Did he insult it? Did he discourage it? Did he hurt its feelings? No. Jesus' words killed the tree. We're not talking about hurtful words spoken to other people. We're talking about changing circumstances through faith-filled words. Jesus said that if you don't doubt in your heart, you could speak to a mountain and it would obey you. Now, I know that theologians can't wrap their heads around that and conclude that there must be some figurative interpretation to what Jesus was saying. And I've heard them say that the fig tree represents Israel and the mountain represents this and the sea represents that. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus also said in Luke 17, 6, that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you could speak to a sycamine tree or a mulberry tree and it would obey you. So it's not about olive trees and mountains or Israel or the temple. It's about speaking words of faith by determining God's will that's revealed in his word, believing it and speaking in agreement with it to see his power manifested on behalf of you and those you're dealing with. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.13, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. And in Ephesians 1, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? My prayer is that all who are watching will come to know the greatness of his power toward us who believe. Thanks for watching and be blessed.